Spanish used the same system for a bit. So many um, linear feet of, of riverfront uh, and then back um, for different distances. Uh, and so you get a, a kind of an organic pattern. The, um, the English used a very different system that's usually known as meets and bounds system that's, that's wholly disorganized. Um, that's, that's based on using existing landmarks. Um, big trees, bends in the river, um, rock outcroppings, anything like that, the more permanent you can find. Um, and so their um, plots tend to be very ir irregular. Um, and then, of course, the, the U.S. land survey system uh, that was begun by the um, uh, Continental Congress soon after um, they came into power. And on this Kaiser Swenson map, you notice some of these little, little numberings um, that show up. This T7R1W uh, refers to uh, Township 7 South and um, Range 1 West. One of the first things the U.S. Congress did was to devise this land survey system. It's a fascinating story. Um, um, Thomas Jefferson had an influence on it. There were other influences. There's really no precedent for it in history. The Romans used a, um, a not dissimilar system, um, but not nearly to the scale that, that we're talking about. Um, pretty much everything uh, west of the Rocky Mountain, the Appalachian Mountains, um, except, um, except Texas. They, they, they managed to um, opt out. Um, and, and that system works by establishing a series of prime meridians and base meridians. Our, our border with Mississippi is one of the base meridians. And then everything gets counted from there. In Louisiana, we have a series of those. There's the dominant one down in the center of the state. And then one that comes down um, just um, through Baton Rouge. Uh, and then it's one that slides a little bit further down. Uh, and so it means counting down seven and over uh, one uh, to get to our... Um, our particular location. And these are six mile squares numbered in this creative um, numbering system. Um, they, um, they, they're divided up into mile squares uh, and then those are divided up into, into quarters and then those are divided up into quarters and, and on and on you go. And so you can see in this map of East Baton Rouge Parish that system is here and is governing and that suggests that that's land that was sold after the Americans were here and after the system was, was in force. Uh, so it's not, it's not complete chaos. Um, in in uh, the city proper, there's a, um, a general kind of east-west, north-south uh, property uh, layout that exists only because the river was running almost north and south. It has absolutely nothing to do with that land survey system, um, even though it looks like it did. This is where this uh, prime meridian uh, comes through, and um, and that's where the, uh, the designation that we have. So if we go back to where our, our fort was, and this um, space um, along the river, um, in the uh, in the 17th century, and this is not by far the oldest map uh, I've seen. Um, I don't know if any of you have been over to uh, David Morgan's uh, chart museum over behind uh, 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 D'Angelo's restaurant, Paul. Um, if you, if you like maps, it's absolutely worth it. He's, he's a nut of a guy. His father taught um, geography here. Um, he grew up as a petroleum geographer, um, started collecting maps when he was in school. Apparently, petroleum geographers do real well. He's retired now and has a collection of, of uh, uh, something like 5,000 maps. It's absolutely phenomenal. And I mean, it's a world-class collection. It's a phenomenal collection of maps that blow you away. He's had recently an exhibition up in the building. This is all he does. He's retired and he keeps his maps. And, and he'll let you sh see a lot of them. But he had an exhibition, about 60 of them up, on the West Florida Republic um, that are Unbelievable historical maps are priceless. I'm up. You mean uh, you mean the Julio's restaurant, right? The Julio's, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm sorry, uh, off of Christian Street. Mm -hmm. The Julio's, yeah, that's right. Thanks. Um, and um, he's he's got some maps that have earlier subdivisions um, of land, that are less um, 
where they're less than these, but this is one of the oldest that's commonly available. And you can see the way the pattern sort of uh, develops perpendicular to the river. Some, some got bigger. Uh, as the river starts to turn, you get a little bit of creative um, change um, involved. And we can take that pattern and um, increase it in size a little bit. Um, and, and this is the way the town of Baton Rouge uh, gets its beginning. So you see the Arpen pattern, and you see essentially here two structured pieces of, of um, urban form. Um, running back from the fort, the first major street that was built just runs perpendicular to river back from where the Fort San Carlos had been, um, was divided up um, and, and became house lots. It runs um, um, all the way back to um, Oh, I guess to where, um, certainly beyond um, 10th Street, beyond that, probably uh, almost as far back as, um, maybe as far back as 19th Street or something like that, um, or, or further, um, and maybe further than that. Um, and then, on this little map, you notice the structured area to the south, one of the earliest real clear maps, um, or a map that shows the city um, in the Civil War, and that shows this pattern that I'm talking about, you can see here um, that Spanish town development, um, the freeway comes through just about here um, today, in the lower area here, and it's been empty for a long time, um, but there were houses all along there, a lot of those uh, burned in the Civil War by the uh, Union Army, uh, and then, of course, this plot here, the Beauregard town plot here. Otherwise, excuse me, other than the fort, this um, bit of land and this, the city has grown chaotically, haphazard, filled in, adjusted, without any real lack of, uh, I mean, without any real sense of vision. The Aborgar town uh, represents a wonderful idea, um, and, and um, for, a mo for a moment there, it looked like it was going to put us squarely in the tradition of town American plans, planned American towns. Um, it's a plan that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, Ely Beauregard uh, <coughs> had the property. Um, Arsène Latour, a French architect planner, worked in New Orleans for a bit, um, did the plan. Um, it was advertised in the beginning of the um, 19th century. This is a New Orleans newspaper. And presented a very interesting kind of um, divided up structure. Um, and this, this paper explains, I don't know if you'll be able to read, but a space for the church in the center, a palace of government, um, a hospital, a college, a, 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 our own Ursuline's convent was uh, pr projected, um, a, a structured streets named after the, um, the continents, and um, just a very visionary, very ambitious kind of, uh, and very thoughtfully laid out kind of, um, kind of town plan. Uh, Buildings facing the main street along the square and then facing the secondary streets as they go back, creating a hierarchy of streets and a coordination of houses with streets um, that would have been really just um, splendid, but alas, it really never, um, it never came to be. This notion of an intentionally planned town, um, we're probably most familiar with here but because of um, something like the Bucure, something like the French Quarter in New Orleans. Um, and this is as close as we ever got to that sort of urban identity. The French Quarter in New Orleans um, is, a, is a noteworthy example of American town planning. Of course, it was laid out by the French, but it follows very closely um, the plans described in the Law of the Indies um, from the mid-16th century, a, a, a Spanish um, document that describes the procedures for settlement and in, in operation in the New World um, that has a very prescriptive um, layout of how one um, should um, should plan towns, uh, and the, the French Quarter follows this, even though it was done by the by the Spanish. Um, a place de arms, an open an open plaza uh, on the river or on the seashore. Um, if it was built on a river or a seashore, um, the church flanked by the um, emblems of uh, governmental authority. Um, the, um, the Spanish and, and the, um, the French both 
um, use the church or coordinated their territorial and colonial uh, operations with the church so it gets a prominent legitimating kind of role. New Orleans um, uh, continued to grow in this way in the first um, uh, decades of its, of its life and into the 19th century, uh, early 19th century at least. You see these beautiful other um, divisions that start to happen with these central squares and regular gridded they're marching around following the, um, the, the river, uh, but, but you see the continuity of it. Um, the closest this kind of thing ever got to Baton Rouge was a proposal for a Spanish town uh, to be known as Galvez down um, not far from where the original of Berthelots was um, by the Amy River, uh, down in that direction. Um, there was some settlement. Um, nothing substantial, um, it was not used for very long and really never worked out. Um, these, um, this notion of these um, law of the Indies towns, these gridded towns with the public square in the center, seems to derive from a, a series of um, uh, towns that were built on the, the border between France and Spain uh, in the late Middle Ages that are known in France at least as the Bastides, um, one of those you, you see here, um, defensive uh, outposts in a sense, and those uh, derive in a rough sense from Roman practice. The Romans, this is an aerial view of Tim God in Northern Africa, an abandoned Roman town that still holds its structure very, very clearly. Um, this kind of plan um, underlays many, many, many European cities. London had one at one time. The South Bank of Paris had one at one time. Um, the, 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 the list goes on and on and on. The impact, for most cases, uh, those uh, have been distorted and have altered over time and don't have the kind of clarity they once did, but that's, that's the tradition. In the United States, this form has been used in lots of ways. If you, if you look at the little town of Clinton, for example, you find a, a very similar kind of form and across, uh, and, and across the um, south. Um, you find these courthouse square towns using the same kind of idea. Not with a church in the center. Occasionally you do get churches locating um, along those, so, but more typically that they're, they're further out, and that's a very American kind of emphasis. The center would be for the courthouse and then businesses, and that's a, that's a, a very common kind of American adaptation of an older kind of form. Now this is a very simple thing. My point here is that we don't have anything like that. We don't have even something that clear here. Right? The town plan that we have has been mm -hmm. cobbled together. This notion of the relationship between an intentional plan that coordinates um, not only patterns of movement, but different types of buildings, dwellings, public monuments, breaks in the neighborhood, has a rich history in the United States, in fact more rich in the United States than anywhere in, in the world. Um, one of the most famous of these, of course, is the plan of Philadelphia, um, laid out at the behest of William Penn, um, and it, it's a fascinating um, plan. Um, you, you see the way this works. It runs between the Skullkill, excuse me, the Delaware and the Skullkill rivers. There is a main sort of connecting avenue that leads to a square in the center, a, a, a secondary avenue, and then four sort of squares in the center of the neighborhood. So it's a plan that seemed to incorporate growth, takes this basic notion and multiplies it and coordinates those things. Really a very brilliant little plan. Um, it's interesting though when you read um, William Penn's uh, instructions to his surveyor, um, he told the guy um, that he hired and sent across the ocean to basically lay out a series of lots running back from the Delaware River 150 feet wide, 70 feet deep, and when he got to the center make one um, about 500 feet wide for his house. <laughs> and this is what he got. 